Okay, so uh, thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, this is uh, actually joint, uh, prepared in collaboration with my colleagues from uh, all modes and also from uh, Riken in, in, in Japan. Um, well, maybe I should talk to the microphone, sorry, I will not turn my head maybe to the slide, I will just stand here. Okay, and uh, what actually uh, we are doing now, we are combining uh, topics uh, that are, uh, okay, I have a slight technical problem, that should, this should be better, yes. So, so we are actually now combining topics that, that were developed for quite some time, uh, like uh, here in, uh, I, I, will, I, I will just skip, skip this using this because I am not familiar with this device and I have very little time. Uh, sorry. Okay. So the timeline is actually of, of physical research is perfectly known. We have quantum mechanics and we have also machine learning. And we are at the place in time and space where actually these two meet. And uh, this is quite interesting time, uh, and this is a really nice place to talk about the, about this topic because, as you know, Professor Ingarden wrote some time ago a paper. This is one of the pioneering papers on uh, on quantum theory and information theory. So uh, this is actually to give you some context that from 2013, basically we have huge, uh, um, uh, let's say. Uh, sp spike interest in machine learning and now we are uh, combining the fields of uh, computer science and um, machine learning. Okay, so as you already know, probably on, from Monday's lecture, uh, Professor Matuszewski told about you know, about like reducing energy consumption uh, related in cla to classical machine learning, okay? But we want to uh, include uh, quantum information in the picture. Okay, so we already know that classical machine learning has many applications. So we we use it actually to every day, especially if you uh, like a technology geek. Okay, so root selection, Google Maps, uh, Facebook, uh, some uh, friend tagging suggestions, estimated type of arrival and, uh, and uh, personalization in Uber and so on and so on. There are many applications. And the main questions that people are, are now trying to answer in the field of uh, like uh, quantum machine learning, that is a new field that's called like that, uh, is can we do machine learning better with quantum physics or can we do actually quantum physics better with machine learning, okay? So there are two, uh, two ways actually to, to approach the project. And uh, there's also a need for new typology in this because um, okay, what does it mean that we are doing quantum machine learning, okay? We can do, uh, uh, apply machine learning to quantum to data generated by quantum systems, or we can actually feed classical data to quantum systems and uh, ask what they think about this, okay? So the, these are those QC and CQ approaches that I listed here. This, this, uh, these are the main two uh, areas that uh, I'm going to address in my talk. Uh, I'm also working some, uh, on the two other cases, but uh, this is a work in progress. And uh, actually, what is machine learning? Machine learning is basically building a predictive model and implicitly programming the model so that it actually can tell you something about the data that it didn't see before, okay? So uh, if you have, for example, uh, two, uh, types of points. This is called supervised machine learning because they are leveled. Uh, leveled. And you want to uh, somehow guess, okay, if I put another point on the, on the board, where would it go, to this class or to the other class? So uh, there are two main approaches that people use to uh, address this problem. And uh, one is to use uh, artificial neural networks. These are very popular. You heard about them on Monday. And uh, the other is actually uh, more like uh, industry grounded because it's, it's very, uh, it's, uh, it has its advantages uh, and it's support vector machines, okay? The problem with support vector machines is that actually they're very good, but for linearly separable uh, sets, okay? That is that if you have Two, point, uh, two types of data and you just draw a line to separate them, that's perfect. You can so solve this problem without uh, uh, much problem with support vector machines. But if you have uh, this curvy, uh, let's say, uh, boundary here, uh, you need something nonlinear. 
And uh, to go there, uh, there's something that we called uh, we call kernel uh, kernel methods. Okay, so you just map uh, some features from from this uh, picture to uh, to a new picture. Okay, so there is some map that takes you from this coordinate set of x1 and x2 to new coordinates where this is actually linearly separable but at the expense actually of introducing uh, more dimensions. So you just start with a small space and you, you move to the larger space and you hopefully will find a hyperplane that will separate your points. And this is, uh, this can be done quite efficiently. And this is also a very attractive approach for quantum computing. Why? Uh, because we can very easily produce large spaces in Hilbert space, okay? I mean, large states in Hilbert space, but we, this is very hard to manipulate them, to make them to interact coherently for a long time. So that's why it's difficult to make practical quantum artificial neural networks, but it's, it might be easier to focus on this kernel-based approach. Okay, so uh, one idea to actually just just like a toy example to to to, to map uh, one dimensional problem to a quantum state is to just encode it in a phase, for example. Okay, uh, and the kernel that I call something that I call the kernel is here, here, here given by this kappa x x prime. Okay, and this boundary here can be expressed. Uh, just this is my last sentence on this slide actually can be expressed by this. Uh, uh, F uh, star function that can be uh, found really efficiently on a classical computer. You just need to know the values of, of the uh, of the kernel for two points. Uh, uh, we need to be efficiently able to calculate this. Okay, so what we did in our research, we actually uh, took uh, some points uh, labeled like with this blue or red uh, color. And uh, we introduced some feature map, and we wanted to check if we can do this. Uh, we can classify the, po the new points uh, uh, good with this uh, kind of approach. Uh, and we also made some theoretical research on this. Okay, it turns out that actually, if you take uh, some feature maps that you can find in the literature, that, that is, uh, you take some quantum states that if you uh, take an inner product of them, you will get some expression. You can obtain the same expression in many ways. And actually, the, the people uh, involved in, in this, they use often this kind of expression because it's simple, but it's not very efficient. If you can see here, the number of qubits actually, uh, this is uh, this number of qubits that you need, where uh, this capital D is the dimension. So we are two-dimensional space for the most of the time. So we use two, just for education purposes. And N is the power here in this cosine kernel uh, N, okay? So you can see that if you have like one qubit, this is quite broad uh, uh, kernel. If it's uh, getting narrower, then you need uh, to use more qubits. But this can be exponentially uh, enhanced by using smarter the decomp uh, decompositions, or or, uh, or if you like to call it uh, um, different feature maps. Okay. So uh, this is uh, what we studied for some time, and we found that we can optimize this and. Um, you can introduce many kernels. Uh, we also tested some ideas that you know from quantum optics, like uh, truncated, uh, let's say, uh, squeezed states or um, uh, or other types of states. And it turns out that uh, well, we have quite a huge freedom here. So uh, I will not maybe go into details, but if you want, you can uh, check our papers. But uh, it turns out that uh, uh, we can uh, well get this exponential enhancement in in, uh, in the number of qubits needed to uh, express a quite narrow kernel, uh, and we can do an ex optical experiment. Okay, so we built a setup. Here is uh, uh, here is uh, like uh, this uh, very nice scheme of it, and here is the picture. Okay, you can don't you cannot tell what's going on uh, here because it's all in the caged system, so it's closed and. Uh, even for an experimentalist, it will be rather hard to decipher what's going on inside. But uh, if you, so, uh, uh, but this is uh, well reality versus the idea, okay? Uh, and uh, we applied uh, some learning uh, algorithm to uh, to get to get here. Fine. So, uh, can we do better with uh, experimental quantum optics than with uh, just a, just a Python? Uh, kernel computed uh, on, a, on a typical computer. Okay, so 
Yes, but by accident. It turned out that actually for the set of points that we measured and we uh, got, got this decision uh, uh, boundaries here, there are some statistical deviation that help us to, uh, to show that uh, uh, on the test set, that is the new data points, five minutes, okay. Uh, the test set, we still have, uh, uh, we, can, we can gain something. Okay, so uh, what, what, how to summarize this? Okay, so uh, we observed that we can actually efficiently compress the information that, we, uh, I mean, the uh, computation of the kernels here with this Rudolf Grover like sp uh, speed up. So if you want to compute something like power kernels, uh, you can uh, compute it faster. And actually, we're still working on showing that we can express something more than classical com computing using the, these methods. Uh, okay, we can scale it to higher dimensions, obviously, uh, with uh, stacking uh, layers of this, but uh, this is not, uh, not, not so much uh, of relevance uh, here. I would like to just say that the same things that we can do can be uh, very conveniently framed in the ten tensor networks uh, uh, theory. Uh, so uh, you can uh, check for the details. And this is the, uh, the last part of uh, my talk that will be much briefer. Um, this is unsupervised learning. Okay, so we can use uh, well um, um, two approaches here. The supervised and unsupervised was uh, the, the approaches were to both described in this paper. But you can actually improve on uh, on usual swap tests that we all all know in uh, of this community, quantum community, and instead of this uh, uh, measure distances in Hilbert space. Uh, like Hilbert Schmidt distance uh, uh, that we uh, experimentally measured in this kind of a setup using uh, hybrid uh, entanglement. Okay, so still it, it turns out that you can you are able to get some asymptotic speed ups. We were not able to show that we can do this better on a, uh, than a classical computer, but we showed that this this could be a way to go because uh, you can uh, show that uh, there is some exponential uh, enhancement here. And also, you can compress some information into a quantum state using dissipative engineering. Well, the results were quite, quite good because uh, there was not much error. And uh, we also tested uh, how much this error affects uh, proper uh, class, uh, I mean, clustering, if we know uh, how would it would be clustered without um, any, any errors. OK. So uh, uh, maybe just a few words literally on uh, how to go from QC to uh, uh, from CQ to QC uh, machine learning. Okay, so obviously uh, we can also use some other ideas for machine learning like uh, optimal control for, uh, for uh, quantum setups, but we can also do something like, like we can apply machine learning to physical research. Okay, and what does it mean? It means that, for example, if you have a quantum router and you want to know if there is entanglement or, I mean, uh, not a router, but this is a relay, uh, and you want to know if it's very entanglement or not, you can use many approaches. For example, like you can uh, just perform here a single projection of this beam splitter, and here's some local uh, measurements. And you can ask uh, like deep neural network, what does it think about, the, about this, if there's entanglement or not. So it turns out that the best uh, proposed by, uh, uh, well, theoretical groups, uh, witnesses that we tested, uh, as outperformed quite significantly by you know, artificial neural networks. So uh, we, there's still a place for improvement uh, in our research if we uh, maybe feed some neural networks with it, if, especially if the problem is very complex. Uh, okay, so this is how we met during the pandemics. This is actually some uh, maybe uh, something that we that sent us 2000 years ago uh, in the past or even more. And uh, this, this are the conclusions from, from, from our presentation. So thank you so much for your attention. Well, thanks a lot for, for this inspiring talk. So we have now time for questions. Uh, Pavel, I guess. Uh, sorry for, do you hear me? Yes, yes I can hear you. Okay. So, um, so, but I kind of missed this uh, protocol actually because you have this in this machine learning with this kernel when you when mm -hmm. you when you encode. Yes. So how it looks step by step? It is like you have these two possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. Or two shapes, whatever whatever they are. Mm -hmm. And how 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 then you go? Because you have to repeat measurements, right? 
Uh, right. So, so this uh, the point. Uh, the thing is that you basically take uh, two points, okay, any two points that are in the training set, uh, and uh, you compute like kernels, kernel values between the points. So you have something like uh, power of two uh, uh, of the, the points in the data set uh, computations that you have to perform in your, in your setup. And then you can express everything in terms of, of, of these values. Okay, and this is the, when this, is, this can be efficiently solved uh, uh, with some linear, specialized linear solvers or with very dumb uh, order of three. Uh, programs. Okay. And this is classical part of the protocol. Is, yes, exactly. Right? Yeah, but I think mm -hmm. Pavel asks, what then you do then with your photons? Exactly. So what, what, what with your photon, with my photons? Okay. So, so we just uh, we just count the photons. Okay. So. Yeah, but how do you prepare? Prepare. Yes? Okay. Because so, I think that there is some encoding. There is encoding and encoding. Yes. Uh, yes. Classical I, picture to the photons. Sorry, I, I was I, I was just. Uh, uh, this is so obvious to me that I didn't get it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry for such a thing. Well, it's, 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 it's my problem. That's why Pavel is here to, you know, to keep you down. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is my problem, okay. Uh, thank you for asking this question. Okay, so we encode the parameters in angles here, okay, and the angles are introduced by uh, wave plates, okay. So here in this uh, part of the setup, we, we encode information by just choosing proper uh, angles of, uh, for, for rotations on uh, mm -hmm. polarization. Okay. So there are two photons with two polarizations, and this is this two, two axes on your classical picture uh, where you plot these dots. Yes, yes. So, so actually, the, the, the axes are, are here. So this is x one. There is two photon is x two, and uh, this is uh, this axis one and x x two is mapped to the angles in front of uh, this uh, uh, in the qubit state. This is like this uh, polarization and dual ray encoding. So top or bottom, uh, vertical, horizontal. Okay. So this is. Okay. And then you make a say swap test, right? Uh, well, it's this overlap thing. Right? Uh, well, we, we first you have to uh, like um, um, if you want to. It depends. Okay, so uh, if you want to compute kernel each time, like, like in this form, yeah. this is your data point, and this is some value that you invented. So the value that that you uh, that that you invented, you encode in the angles on 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 these plates. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here there is your initial quantum information, and here is the point in your, uh, let's say, feature map spa space where you want to go and to check what's the value. Okay, so this is, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, so we can select the, the, the angles here to correspond to another point from the um, training set, or we can actually choose an, uh, an arbitrary point in, in space. Okay, so this is how we actually got, the, uh, uh, maybe not this, but because this is a simulation, uh, this is based on experimental data, uh, and, and these plots, okay, so this is... Uh, right, mm -hmm. uh -huh. so you, you have to repeat it many times, right? Because yes. Because you have to, you have to yeah, so just I'm, kind of cover, cover the... the... Mm -hmm. Exactly, mm -hmm. so, so we, we measured about uh, 800 uh, data points, okay, so this is uh, how, how we got... Uh, the pictures. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, so we are getting it, I think. So, uh, other questions? Oh, uh, uh, if not, uh -huh. uh, maybe microphone. Uh -huh. How long the experiment uh, lasts typically? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, this is actually, I'm not sure, uh, it's, it's not on a visible slide, but I, I have many slides on this, and I, I can actually uh, tell you that, uh, um, okay, um, great, so uh, this is like, like 10 seconds per one photon pair, okay, uh, so this is, this is quite a long time, why is that, this is because uh, we use motorized uh, polarization rota rotators, and this is about the time that uh, this is the order of time that it takes to ch ch change it for a, for a new point. So this is uh, so this is the limitation. Okay, so ten seconds, and uh, we uh, for uh, like uh, seven uh, thousand for for thousand uh, let's say points. 
So ten thousand seconds, maybe the expert. <laughs> okay. 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 Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any any further questions? I I don't see. So let's thank Carol again. Thank you.